Our world is ruled by a racket. This racket is an amalgamation of different players, comprised of corporations, banks, hedge and mutual funds, insurance companies, the many different concentrations of private wealth we have in our society. We often don't know the names of the people who run these institutions, but they have massive amounts of power and are backed by the American government and, as a last resort, the US military. But this racket is only allowed to function untouched and remain hidden because of the media in the West which covers for them. It gives their rapacious actions a moral sheen and maintains the potent ideologies whereby theft from the poor by the rich is translated through the mass media into altruistic projects for the world's poor. It is this same media that has us thinking that it's merely a mistake that the world's richest 85 people have as much as the poorest 3.5 billion people combined, as reported last year by The Independent. Or that half of global wealth is held by the 1%, as reported here in The Guardian. But it's not some mistake. It's not a quirk of history. This is the system running as it should, and it's getting worse. In fact, Oxfam had to downgrade their previous analysis that 85 people owned half the world's wealth to just 80 people a year later. The media, which covers for the racket, is not, by coincidence, owned by the racket. In the US, six companies own 90% of the media. It's the same in the UK too, where Rupert Murdoch, the Australian oligarch, pumps his reactionary pollution into society through The Times, The Sun and B Sky B. His company, News International, even after the closure of the News of the World, still comprises 34% of newspaper circulation and, had it not been for the phone hacking revelations in the UK, it would almost certainly have acquired 100% of Sky. I worked at the Financial Times for a number of years and I got to see how this system works at the coalface. We weren't told what to write exactly. No one ever did that. By the time you reach the dizzy heights of these ideological institutions, they assume you will have already internalised what you can and can't say. But I didn't change how I thought or wrote, and I tested the waters. In an interview piece I wrote about Nawal el Sadawi, I referenced former Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak and added the factual prefix US-backed to see if it would get through. It was excised by editors without a thought. I managed to get some things through the many filters of the corporate media. My first story, for instance, at the paper was about how mining companies were using their corporate social responsibility programs to cover up for the fact many of their workers were still dying while on duty. Miners' efforts failed to cut death toll was the eventual story, and it caused the mining companies or their public relations agents to go apoplectic. Many PR people view journalists as accomplices rather than enemies. I don't blame them. 99% of the time, they are accomplices. I followed that up a couple of months later when I went to the British archives in Kew Gardens to view documents being released under the 30-year secrecy rule. I found documents detailing British support for Saddam Hussein's coup in Iraq and gushing telegrams about the butcher sent back to London by British diplomatic staff. The article was headlined Saddam was well regarded by British, printed on page two of the FT, which was the only newspaper to even reference the documents related to Iraq. Even the so-called left-wing media didn't touch it. It didn't fit with the fairy tale narrative that Saddam was an enemy of the good guys. At the Financial Times, I saw the racket and how it operates up close. I went to Haiti 18 months after the devastating earthquake of 2010 to do a story on the economic reconstruction. I was taken around in a 4x4 by the World Bank, who informed me of how the mass privatisation of the Haitian people's assets was the way forward, as well as building sweatshops. My articles for the FT, Haiti struggles to rebuild, and instability hits investment in Haiti, raised how the aid and lending communities were worried about the willingness of the private sector to take over basic state functions, healthcare, education, water. When I left the FT, I wrote a piece for Open Democracy revealing the true story of what I had seen, a rigorous economic program imposed by the rich world agencies and governments which took no account of Haitians' real needs. This was the shock doctrine being imposed on the Haitian people. This experience in Haiti showed me how powerful the multilateral institutions really are whether it's the IMF, 
the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, the poor people of the world and their often weak governments are powerless against the plans these bodies have for their country. I was also sent by the FT to South Africa to cover the world's biggest mining event called the Mining in Daba. I wrote of how the miners raised a fresh toast to the mood of optimism. This involved hours of ministerial delegations from poor African countries telling foreign companies and investors how wonderfully they would be treated if they would set up shop in their countries. Mines would never be nationalised. Taxes or royalties would never be hiked. Never, in other words, would African people see the wealth that was being extracted from their land. The companies talked of their commitment to so-called corporate social responsibility in return for extracting these minerals. They talked of the positive things they would bring to African countries in the process of extracting their minerals. But when I started analysing this talk, it became clear quite quickly that it was just propaganda. In reality, I saw that mining companies often had trouble working in these countries because of local resistance. They were desperately trying to change perceptions as it was affecting their ability to make a killing. Off the back of this, I wrote an article for The Nation questioning how sustainable, socially responsible mining really is. One activist I spoke to said, the recent murders of mining organizers in Mexico and Guatemala and toxic waste spills, such as that at Barrick Gold's North Mara Mine in Tanzania, make it very hard for the mining companies to convince us that their conduct has improved. She believed that the only thing that had changed was the mining company's attention to and investment in projecting an image of themselves as socially environmentally responsible. In Washington DC, I was exposed to what I called the political representatives of the racket, the Republican Party. I covered the regulatory body, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. I wrote articles about how the EPA bears the brunt of Republican ire and fears rise of cuts to US screen watchdog. Private capital loathe the EPA. They are attacking them non-stop, just for tepid protections of the American people's water and even mountain formations themselves, which some coal companies wanted to blow up and had done. In DC, they were joined by the National Chamber of Commerce, the most powerful lobby group. For them, anything that hurt the ability of business to make profits was the devil incarnate. They are the black heart of the racket at home in the US. Needless to say, with this type of behaviour, I didn't last too long at the Financial Times. However, I also experienced the liberal media covering for the racket too. The Guardian in the UK, probably the most liberal mainstream daily newspaper in the world, is also heavily tied up with the racket. If you click on the city section of its website, you will find it sponsored by the neoliberal Rockefeller Foundation. If you go to the Global Development section, it's sponsored by the equally neoliberal Gates Foundation. The Guardian Sustainable Business Zone has a social impact section sponsored by the mining giant Anglo-American. The Sustainable Living section is sponsored by consumer goods giant Unilever. The Guardian itself officially says that this sponsorship has no impact on how it reports news, but I had my own experience of how this may be not the whole truth. In my article, Water Everywhere for Profit in the Hapa, but few drops for local people to drink, I reported from a town in El Salvador where many residents could not afford clean drinking water for themselves or their families, despite the fact they lived on top of a huge aquifer. When I was preparing the story, the brewing company SAB Miller were interested in the contents of the article. They sent me a report authored with Oxfam and the Hapa. I mentioned them briefly in the piece and quoted them saying they understand that Nahapa is a water stress region and they support the local communities in their struggle to access clean water. But just a few days later, I noticed that The Guardian was carrying a news article on its website, Latin America's water woes blamed on politics and poor infrastructure. It was a 900 word interview with Carl Lippert, president of the Latin American division of Saab Miller, detailing his company's commitment to water security and responding at length to the criticism in our article over corporate control of water in Nahapa. He said Nahapa's problems were a microcosm of the challenges facing the whole of Latin America and referred to lack of infrastructure and increased population resulting in no access to water. He then went on to say that there isn't really a problem of water availability in Nahapa. 
slightly contradictory to what I had witnessed. This article ran three days after our story and spoke at length about what we had uncovered. The Guardian had a partner zone sponsored by SAB Miller on their website. Could this have been the connection? What hope do we have if this is the progressive extreme of the mainstream media in the United States and United Kingdom? The racket defines what is acceptable progressive opinion and tells us how far we can go. It restricts our imagination, forces us to worship our oppressors, and creates the illusion of fighting for justice while undermining the leaders and popular movements that will bring it about. The racket is deep in every crevice of the mass media, and we won't be free until that hold is broken.